Remember, he is up to something. He is doing something healing right now. Not ours always to understand, but it's always ours to at least realize he's still on the throne. He's still in control. Sharon asked me last night, asked, what was the question you asked me last night about the sermon? Sharon asked, are you preaching a Mother's Day sermon? To which I responded, not, not specifically, but there is a reference. There is a reference in the scripture, even as we continue the sermon series that we began preaching through the Gospel of John. Now, I may not repeat this every week, but I will from time to time because it can't be overemphasize the foundational significant and relevant truth of the message of the gospel is how John begins his gospel talking about the word the supreme authority and creator of the universe which became flesh in Jesus that is significant the relevance is from verse 12 of chapter 1 as we believe that word becomes flesh in us, even you and I. But as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. So we wrapped up chapter one. We went into chapter two with the first miracle, which was uh, where Jesus went to the wedding feast. And what happened at the wedding feast? Water in the wine. Wine is so fine. Oh, so fine. Thank you. Water to wine, oh, so fine. Now, the underlying theological uh, discussion that comes from water to wine is the fact that Jesus came to do something different. And theologians would discuss that. that the water would represent the law that they lived by, but Jesus come to usher in his New Testament, the New Testament of grace and love and his sacrifice. Water to wine, no comparison. And then last week there were some practical uh, applications that when Jesus does things, it's not always something that fits into what we might expect, but normally is better. So this morning, looking further in to chapter 2 and verse 12 through verses 22. I'll read that text in a moment. Business as usual at the temple.
Did you get the idea from the video that Jesus wasn't pleased with what was going on in the temple? Okay, now I'm going to read the scripture from John 2, and there's a significant uh, difference from this scripture, or there, there, it's like, have you ever, uh, we did this in, in school, and sometimes you see a, something post up on the internet, two pictures side by side that look, just at first glance, look, oh yeah, they're the same thing. But then find the six differences between this picture and this picture. You see that it's like the restaurant, the little coloring pages for the kids. So as I read this scripture, see if you recognize something that stands out different between what I'm reading and what you just watched. After this, Jesus went down to Capernaum and he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Passover feast was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money. <coughs> we just saw that, right? Okay. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen poured in poured out all the money changers' money and overthrew the table. <laughs> you see that? Were you watching? You just watched that. And he said unto them, Take these things out, and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, <coughs> The zeal of the house had eaten me up. Then answered the Jews unto him, What sign showest thou, seeing that thou dost these things? And Jesus answered and said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty-six years it took this temple to be built, and thou will rear it up in three days. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. So after hearing the scripture, after seeing the video, did anybody notice anything significant? Okay. That's a worthy observation. I'm going to argue with you. Anybody else? What about his uh, short veil? His demeanor is different. I mean, this is just all about the same, whereas he's talking to everyone. Okay. Here's a significant difference. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are consistent as they tell this story where he spoke. Now in John, when he spoke, he said, take these things out. Don't make my father's house a place of merchandise. And then when they challenged him, he said, there's the temple down, and in three days I'll rise it up again. That's the only dialogue we hear from John's gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they tell this story, the dialogue is different in that he says, he kind of elaborates on this idea, don't make my father's temple a house of merchandise, but then he gives a statement regarding what the temple should be. So if it's not a house of merchandise, then what, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, did he say that it should be? Anybody? What? Here? Did you hear that? Well, if 
If you heard that, Oh, you were reading from the Common English Bible. You were following Common English. Yeah. I read from the King James, and King James says, he just simply says, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, I may have inadvertently added in as I read it, because I know Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He says, My father's house shall be a house of prayer. So uh, Priscilla was reading along common with the English Bible, and they helped John out a little bit to kind of blend those together. Not just a place of formality, tradition. The first priority of God's temple is this to be a house of prayer. Now, Primarily, what Jesus is taking issue with, and what the emphasis that Jesus is stressing here is the priority of worship. First priority of worship should be prayer. And I've got a couple of comments to, to say about uh, priority in worship and buying and selling, how buying and selling contrasts with what it should be prayer. But before I get there at this one point out from verses 21 and 22. In John, he says, Tear this temple down, three days I'll rise it up again. And, and that just, just literally blew their mind. What in the world is he talking about? But John helps us out. John does this a lot through his gospel. Uh, not always is it in parentheses, but a lot of times it is. John adds his interpretation or explanation. He'll say, well, this he said because. And you, you'll see John giving those kind of afterthought, oh, this he said because. And we get the idea from John's gospel. John's not writing to, to, to give us a historical account so much as he's writing to give us the relevance, the meaning, and the explanation. And that's why his uh, chronology, the order of events, doesn't really sync up, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you don't find this event till the last week that Jesus was on earth before he was crucified. John at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So, Bible scholars have argued over the years, did Jesus do this once or did he do it twice? Because John clearly states that it was at the beginning of his ministry, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the implication in order of events puts it near the end of his ministry. So the explanation, did he do this twice? Here's my personal perspective. I think it was one event. But John's not writing to give us uh, uh, order of events and historical accounts so much as he's given a, as if Matthew, Mark, and Luke give you the, their account. Here's my take on what they said. This is what he did. This is what it really means. And he starts out and sets up Jesus as an equal in the Trinity with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the creator of the universe. And then he begins to tell us about these events. And oh, by the way, this is what it means. It's just his style. So John explains when he says, tear this temple down. Three days I'll rise it up. They said, well, what in the world are you talking about? And then John said, this he said, because he was referring to what? referring to his body and the resurrection. And then John goes on to say, it took time even for the disciples to figure that part out. They had to experience walking with him for a few years, and then after he ascended, probably as they were discussing some night before they put their heads on the pillow, oh, you remember what he said in the temple? And the presence of the Holy Spirit is our bodies 
and the spirit in us, our bodies are really the temple. Oh, back in the temple, he was talking about his body. They thought they were tearing that temple down because God was in him, but in three days he rose again. Significance and meaning and looking back, it makes perfect sense, don't it? When at the time, when at the time it was nonsense, where in the world are they coming from? So I, I said all of that to offer this. Does that sound familiar about someone that you had a special relationship with early in life and through your life? What is today? Yes. Did mom in your early years ever tell you something that you thought, oh, mom, if you only knew. Did you ever think that? And then later on in life, you figure out, mom knew. Does that sound familiar? So, so even in this scripture of Jesus clearing the temple, I could make application here to honor our mothers, and we grow to appreciate those things at the time. I remember uh, one of my mom's liners that I thought was one of the stupidest, logic, nonsensical uh, sayings. Let me tell you something, mister. You tell one line, you'll have to tell another one to back it up. And I'm thinking, so what's the point? What, what, what's the relevance of that? You do something in town, I'll find out before you get back home. So that's why I'm the youngest of six kids and, and of my five siblings, two of them were brothers. And one of my brothers has since passed, but but we've shared several times we grew up in the country. And when we started driving out on the road by ourselves, we didn't always observe the speed limits. And sometimes there's a mile or two, three miles of road without any houses, and we'd be on a county road doing highway speed limits, or better. But when you come within sound range of a house of a neighbor, guess what you did? You didn't only let your foot off the accelerator, you hit the brake. And you kind of cruised by with the windows down, listening to Amazing Grace on the stereo. <laughs> as you drove by the neighbor's house. Because <laughs> mom was going to find out. Don't know how, but she did, didn't she? So thank God for our mothers wisdom that we're not capable of understanding in the moment but in time it plays out so it is with the teachings of jesus if we take it to heart we walk with him it'll sort out in the end and we will figure it out as absurd as it may have sounded at the time they came to understand it Jesus knew what he was doing, knew what he was talking about. But his problem here in the temple, and the lesson here is first and foremost a lesson about <coughs> worship. And the priority in worship should first and foremost be prayer. And what they were doing, they were putting, the, as you've heard me use the phrase, they were putting the emphasis on the wrong side of the bowl. They were kind of just going through the motions. Because that's what they had always done, and it became a high priority, the buying and selling of animals. And hey, it's kind of inconvenient to do this, out in the outer lots or or 
outside. Wouldn't it be better if we just bring it inside the temple walls? Caring for convenience. Worship is not always about what's most convenient for us. And Jesus makes that point clearly. Now here's another major distinction. The buying and selling of merchandise, and we can replace that easily if, if we just think, what do we consider worship? Maybe the order of worship, the music, the style of music, uh, timing, and all of these traditions or expectations. When we put the emphasis on what we think, all the emphasis kind of boils down to what we do in worship or how we do what we do in worship. Jesus says, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. And when the emphasis is on prayer, then it changes the priority from focusing on what we can do, how we do what we do, when we do what we do, to focusing on what God has already done and getting in tune to what God wants to do. Worship, it's not all about me. And guess what? It's not all about you either. It should be all about God what he has done in celebration and recognition and in awe and then in turn the anticipation not to what we can do or how we can do it but what does God want to continue to do it's all about him his doing and what he wants to do through us and when we get that out of out of perspective then we can just picture in our mind Jesus physically showing up and saying, what in the world are you doing? What have you turned this hour of worship into? It should be all about God. And you're focusing all your attention on yourself and what you do. One of the big problems that rightfully gets in the way of proper worship and focusing what matters most sometimes is tradition or the way it used to be. And I laugh at myself because I'm just as guilty as anybody else. So this past week I, I posted, a, I don't know, kind of a lengthy narrative on Facebook about this oil spout. Now, not everybody can appreciate this, but some of you might be able to. I grew up in the country. We always had a few meters around the front yard, and for the most part, we always changed our oil and filter in, in the driveway. Most of the time, just draining the oil out on the gravel driveway and letting it soak in. Oil came, we called it cans. Now, before my time, oil was actually in tin cans or metal cans, but in my time, my frame of reference, we called it a can, but it really wasn't metal. It had a metal top and metal bottom. It was kind of like a coated cardboard or paper made up of can. But we drained the oil out, we get this oil can, and the ideal way to, to put oil in your car is if you had one of these oil spouts. You just kind of press it down in there and <coughs> tilt it. We grew up in the country. What tools dad had weren't the best tools in the world. Now over time through the years, we may have had probably a dozen or more of these oil spouts, but they were usually probably bought at Kmart or at the local Western Auto store for about 99 cents and they were junk. If you could 
get through one oil change, four or five quarts, then the point on what punctured the top of that can would be dull, and instead of pressing down the can, it would just collapse the can. Beth, you were shaking your head. You, you try to poke it in, and all you did is crumple up the, the can. Then when it does go in, you go tilt it, and it would leak as much oil out around it as it would. But if you had a decent oil spout, that didn't happen. Better tools, better results, right? So we would always settle for just getting a can over or, or trying to puncture the top of that can with the screwdriver on this making day. Fast forward to 1983. I was a sophomore in college. And the guy that lived in our college town had owned a model parts store and he had this weekend tent sale. And I got hired to be a night watchman, spend the night in the tent with the tools to keep people just from pilfering through. So the whole tent, Lonnie would have hated it. <laughs> but they're like Harbor Freight of the 80s, outdoor tent sale, tools, uh, you name it. And I'm all night long, nothing to do. I'm just looking at that, would be a pretty good deal. But laying on the table was this vinyl coated oil spout, had a retail price on it. This was in the 80s. $13.99. It was heavy duty, vinyl coated, sturdy. Wow. Never owned an oil spout like that. That's just a trick. Mark for 50 cents. So the next morning before I left, I got a handful of vitamins. I was proud of that 50 cent oil spout. I felt good about it. I owned it for three days before I realized. You can't even buy oil in cans anymore. <laughs> I didn't even remember the last time I had put oil in a vehicle from a can. And I thought, that's why it was marked down 50 cents. <laughs> Nobody needs it. But in my mind for those two days, oh, wow, this is great. Good job, man, what a lucky deal. Only to find out that the most usefulness that that would have ever had is if I would have kept it, I could show it to you today. <laughs> but I don't know what happened to it because it was useless. And I can put a picture up on the screen and tell the story with the same effect, right? Except I know Danielle would probably thinking that story would mean a lot more to me if he actually had one that I can hold, right? So I apologize. But that's just an example sometimes of how we think if you're going to change the oil in your car, best way to just get one of these oil spouts. Well, it used to be not so effective anymore. Is that relevant? I'm not talking about church setting or community setting. I'm talking about personal decisions that we made. If I could only feel like I used to feel, do what I used to do. I noticed that this morning, uh, I think it was the, no, I never even got to the music yet. When I just said, good morning, Packerton. Couldn't really get it out. My voice cracked and I had to, had to back off. Oh, if I could only have that voice that I used to have from my 20s or 30s, then I could be an effective presenter and speaker. Well, guess what? Things change. Does that mean that I'm done? Might as well give up. Can't do this or that like I used to do, so it must be done. We play games like that in our mind. We put the emphasis on the wrong place. 
Jesus says, my house should be a house of prayer. And the focus should be more on what he has already done and what he wants to continue doing. And that has to take priority over what we're doing or what we think we can do. It's all up to him. Does that make sense? The temple was very significant. The history of the temple actually started in the wilderness as the people were basically camping in the wilderness in tents. And God gave instruction that among their tents they would build what they called a tabernacle, which was a huge structure that represented God's tent among the people's tent. That's where God lived. Once they settled in, in Israel, after the fall of Jericho and after they settled, several hundred years passed before King Solomon actually built the physical structure. Great uh, emphasis and there was great significance to the building of the temple. It was David's dream to establish the temple as king, but God told him, no, your son will build the temple. And it's amazing significance when we read and we find out that there were some 10,000 crafted uh, uh, tradesmen that built the altar. A thousand of the tradesmen were priests that worked in the parts of the innermost part of the temple that represented the Holy of Holies. That's where God was. And as they looked at the temple, that's where God is. And it was so significant that only priests could be engaged in certain areas of it. God's presence, where God is. So another relevance that we get uh, from this scripture regarding the modern day relevancy of the temple, God's presence, we get from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The disciples came to figure out, you know what Jesus was talking about, tear this temple down, he talked about his body, and he rose it up again, and he talked about sending the Holy Spirit that would dwell in us, and then the writer of 1 Corinthians sums it up like this. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit dwelleth in you? That's consistent with the teaching I get from John of the Word becoming flesh in the believer. We are the temple. God's flesh dwelleth in you. And if any man defile the temple, God shall destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are. So, the, the challenge there, if we are God's temple, then the same priority for how we use our bodies can be either for holy purpose and worship or just for ourselves. If it's just about what we can do, then Jesus would want to come in and say, let's clean this up a little bit. But if it's about really recognizing who God is, what he wants to do, if our bodies are the temple, Let's just be reminded that Jesus is very concerned about what goes on inside the temple. If we read that verse from 2 Corinthians 3, 17, the last phrase says, which temple ye are, period. Paul well, saying, you are the temple temple of God which temple ye are in making a statement but after he sets it up no united body is the temple for the Holy Spirit lives in you 
and he's don't defile the temple. It should be holy. And we can take that closing in, it's kind of a relevant challenge as if he could ask instead, instead of saying which temple you are in the temple of God, the challenge is which temple are ye? What's most important in you? At the end of the day from uh, John chapter 2 verses 12 through 22 the implication is Jesus desires a clean and pure temple with proper priorities. The application of that to our life is personal. How do we decide what's most important? Is it all about us or is it all about him? In closing this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I don't have the number in my notes, but I think it's here. 404. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. In my worship, in my daily life, he's the potter, we're the clay, and he desires that in his temple that he have his way in our life. Let's stand and sing together.